In this video we will build the next version of the sprocket screw dispenser mechanism. During the last years I've manually packaged and counted thousands of different screws, nuts and washers. All for 3D printed parts that I sell online. So I use 3D printing, PCB design and other processes to build an automatic screw counting machine. The design is based on some fundamental principles and it is parametric so it should work for a variety of conveyed parts. In this video series I will go over the components and how I built them. If all goes well the videos will end with a working modular production system. In one of the last videos we built this 3D printed dispensing mechanism and it allowed us to um, automatically package screws, nuts and washers into plastic bags. Additionally this allows us to feed varying numbers of fasteners to robotic assemblers or other automation modules. However this part is far from being finished and there is still a lot of stuff to do. On the mechanical side of this module there are two main issues that we have to face. First it has no protective housing but rotating gears and I would really like to avoid getting my fingers into this. Second, due to the stepper motor that is sticking out on the side, it is really large and has a large footprint. And this really limits the number of magazines that we can put in a limited space side by side. So to save our fingers and um, keep the whole thing more compact, we have to somehow redesign this module. Okay, so this is the old design. First, we need to think about if we want to keep this specific motor. The stepper motor is the widest part of the assembly and therefore it dictates its minimum dimensions. This NEMA 17 motor type is quite popular, mainly due to its use in 3D printers and it's therefore quite cheap. Since we want to keep the sprocket as low in the magazine as possible to improve filling capacity and response time, there's really only one logical position left for the motor. The rest of the housing design is pretty straightforward. There was especially one point I really liked about the old design. Because the gear train was visible, you could see everything and immediately understand what was happening. To maintain that transparency, we can take a transparent acrylic panel as a cover. In my opinion this is very helpful if people who operate whatever machine can understand how exactly it works. As an alternative for the transparent acrylic, we could also use some sort of a 3D printed grid structure. But since laser cut acrylic is really inexpensive and also this part doesn't change parametrically with the rest of the design, I think there's not really a point in 3D printing it. I think 3D printing this would be a perfect example of the saying if all you have is a hammer then everything looks like a nail. Okay, so let's build it. After we printed the components we can start with the assembly. First the stepper motor is mounted. For this I use one of my favorite tricks for small parts that just love to disappear from tables. By combining the parts into a single printed piece, the whole thing becomes much less fiddly and the parts don't get lost. This connection definitely has no structural integrity, but it doesn't need to. Its only purpose is to arrange the parts for assembly. Next, the gear train is assembled. It is very similar to the one in the last version. Now we can put on the laser cut cover and attach the service panel. After the last bolts for the stepper motor, the compact module is ready. We can now insert and position it in a magazine of any length. Theoretically, we can even arrange several dispenser modules in one magazine 
and this could prove useful for future modules. If we now test the whole module on some M5 nuts, we can see that the basic principle of the previous version still works. The sprocket that retains the nuts is a component that is expected to wear over time. I think depending on the material that we print this part from, it will last for at least 200,000 pieces. But it still makes sense to add some sort of a service panel for easier replacement. I believe, especially in larger assemblies, we should really try to use one color for parts that are subject to wear, because this will make it so much easier for the user to identify intuitively parts that will need replacement after a while. Now we still need to couple the magazine to the output of the main feeder unit. I really can't point out enough how important a precise and repeatable alignment of both of the components is. Any gap or edge will eventually lead to a blocked path. Let me explain. Okay, so this is the component that redirects the nuts from the feeder unit. The magazine gets connected to this segment. When both of the segments are perfectly aligned, then the nuts just slide through. But if there's an edge, they will get stuck. So far, this is pretty intuitive. What is not so intuitive is how sensitive this is. In other words, how perfect this transition has to be to avoid a problem. Normally, the nuts just run through here, but sometimes a phenomenon occurs that I call a drain of nuts. The surface of nuts or fasteners in general looks nice and smooth at first impression. But when you look at it under a microscope, you can see that it's much rougher than one would expect. Also, there is some residue from the manufacturing process of the nuts that is sometimes sticking to them. And that's why sometimes a single nut slides slower through the channel than the others, and some start to pile up behind it. A train of nuts is created. If such a train of nuts occurs together with the little tiniest edge, they get stuck. The following nuts are pushing on the first one, which is constantly trying to pivot in the channel. So the problem is not that the channel is too narrow, but that the leading nut is permanently searching for an edge to grab onto due to the back pressure it encounters. And this behavior is so extreme that even an edge of less than a tenth of a millimeter becomes a problem. A tenth of a millimeter is such a small imperfection that you can just barely feel it with your fingernail. So even if you would maybe not even notice it, a nut will find it. Small details like this are the main reason why building a machine with 3D printed components can be so difficult. Generally speaking, the surface finish of a 3D printed component just won't be as good as that of a traditionally machined part. For example, as a rule of thumb, layer lines in FDM prints have a depth of around a third of the layer height. And those minor surface imperfections are, with challenging parts like nuts, already enough to cause a jam. However, there are a few tricks how we can avoid this, and we will take a look at those in the upcoming videos. And I definitely believe that even though it is quite hard to build such a complex machine with such a high percentage of 3D printed components, if we make it work, then the whole parametric customizability of that machine is going to be worth it. Okay, to be fair, I may have gotten a little off topic here. The important thing to note is that we not only couple two components with a good surface finish together, but also that we couple them repeatable and with a high certainty of location. Simply bolting together the two components appears to be the easiest solution, but this would not have the quick lock capabilities that are really useful, and additionally, it's not really a good idea to just use bolts as locating features. To allow bolts to be easily driven into their corresponding threads, the threads are intended to have some play. This makes it practically impossible to couple two parts together repeatable and accurate while just relying on a regular bolt as a locating feature. The two parts would just end up in a slightly different position each time. So instead I came up with this design. It uses an 8mm dowel pin and two printed snap-fit joints. 
and this appears to work really well and it also constrains the magazine very well. By stacking up two feeder units and connecting them to their magazines, we can now dispense nuts and bolts simultaneously. It obviously still has to prove itself in durability testing and it should skeptically be noted that the design is now much more constrained than it was before. An almost perfect alignment of, for example, the gear train is now necessary and this was really an advantage of the previous more flexible um, one-armed version. One more use case that the whole quick lock mechanism enables is to use the magazine um, in a longer version like this one and take the feeder unit just as a refill station. This would allow to take the magazine with the pre-oriented screws to a personal workstation. I think this could turn out really practical. So there's still a lot of super exciting stuff to do. And if you want to see me build those prototypes, then hit the subscribe button. And I will see you in the next video.